retinal canal. A good place to start is on the rectus abdominis. It's nice and easy to identify. There's the anterior rectus sheath. Here's the posterior rectus sheath. And you can see the inferior epigastric artery here. As we move down, follow the muscle to its insertion onto the pubic symphysis. So there's the symphysis. This is the pubic tubercle. And the tubercle is what we want to aim for in our longitudinal view. So step one in finding the inguinal canal is to find the superficial ring. So that's where our spermatic cord exits. So here's the rectus abdominis. It's nice and easy to find. There's the pubic tubercle. So we put the pubic tubercle on the lower end of our image. Now what we're going to do is translate the, the camera 5 mil to a centimetre lateral. The rectus abdominis is going to thin out and we're just left with a thin white line inserting on the pubic tubercle. This is our conjoint tendon. Now I'm going to take the pressure off and move another 5 mil to a centimetre and we're looking for veins. So the minute we take our pressure off, we can see the pan-piniform veins that accompany the spermatic cord or the, the vas deferens. So once we've found the veins, we know that we're close to the superficial ring. At this point, you rotate the top of the camera towards the ASIS. And now we can see the spermatic cord from here to here and we can follow the posterior wall of the inguinal canal up towards the ASIS. So we're going to just slide towards the ASIS and look for these veins travelling horizontally until they drop into the abdomen. So they change direction. There you go. So they're dropping into the abdomen. So between the artery that we see posteriorly and the top of those veins there, this is the deep ring. So this is the entrance to the inguinal, inguinal canal. So we're ready to perform a valsalve manoeuvre, but if we leave our camera directly on top, you're likely to get pushed off. So if you just take a leap of faith and slide laterally in the same orientation and lay the camera down flatter, we can come in on the side of the deep ring. So we're looking for the veins dropping into the abdomen, the inferior epigastric artery there, and in front, we can often see a little muscular triangle, which is the internal oblique uh, sort of terminating into its fascia. So the roof of the inguinal canal, there it is there. That's the continuation of the external oblique. So we call it the external oblique aponeurosis. And then at the back of this spermatic cord, the posterior wall is formed by transversalis fascia and peritoneum. So these are all the landmarks that we identify. So now that we're at the deep ring, we're going to measure it. So a normal male spermatic cord doesn't usually exceed a centimetre. So the deep ring on re relaxation here is seven millimetres. And now what we're interested in is the measurement on strain. So if you could push your abdomen towards the ceiling, so distend the tummy, big push. And relax. So it might take a few attempts. We fell off that time, so we're going to try again. This is the deep ring here, so pushing just slowly. And relax. So you can see something's moving here, but the deep ring is not very exciting. <laughs> um, we're going to try and keep straining just to make sure that that doesn't open later, but the movement we saw was to the right of the screen. So the first thing we're going to do is come back to the superficial ring. Okay, and we're going to look at the contents of the inguinal canal and decide if there's anything in addition to the spermatic cord. So a big push here. And you can see this sort of blunt-ended perineal sac coming into the inguinal canal from more posteriorly. So this is a defect here in the posterior wall. You can see it contains more than just fat. So this component's fat, but if you have a look, this is peristalsing. And then if you relax... And push that in. So this was there was a defect behind the spermatic cord allowing a hernia into the inguinal canal but it wasn't extending beyond the superficial ring. So the superficial ring if we measure it is from here to here it's where we can see the external uh, aponeurosis ending to allow these veins out to the region just below beneath the skin and subcutaneous fat. So if we follow 
those veins back up. Let's have a look at the deep ring one more time. So nice big push. And if you keep them straining, it gives you time just to slide around and find that same landmark. So if I come in a bit more laterally, there's the spermatic cord. And then if you relax, one more push there. And relax. Okay, so that deep ring is staying nice and small. There's nothing entering in along with the spermatic cord. Okay, so then we would come down and measure the defect and look at, to see whether it's reducible. So if you could do one more push there. So you can see the defect size would be measured from here to here and in transverse the same. We can see it from here to here and relax. Something that may be useful when you're looking for indirect and direct hernias is a transverse approach as well. So in the transverse approach, start with the camera on the pubic tubercle and then look immediately superolateral to the tubercle and we can see the somatic cord, the vas deferens, take the pressure off and you can see the veins. So that gives away the location of the superficial ring. You can see the inguinal ligament behind. So the superficial ring, if we move immediately above it, we can ask the patient to strain and you keep your eyes at the level of the peritoneum a big push there. So you can see the cords being displaced and we can see something else entering the inguinal canal and then relax. So clearly there's a hernia near the level of the superficial ring. If we move a little higher we can actually slide back and trace that um, spermatic cord all the way to the deep ring. So its deep ring is here and then come below the level of inferior epigastric artery. Have a look at the posterior wall now of the inguinal canal during another strain. So you can see there's a little gap there, big push. And relax. And we have a direct hernia. So direct hernias usually look like atomic bombs. The trajectory comes straight up at the camera from behind so it doesn't usually travel along the, the screen from side to side so indirect hernias they follow this line of the somatic cord so you can see the deep ring from here to here the posterior wall of the canal from here and now this hernia if I move more medially and push here you can see distortion so big strain you'll see distortion of the conjoint tendon and it comes up like a little mushroom, so vertically. And they're usually quite large defects. In this case, the defects from here to here. And relax. So nearly three centimetres, which is very typical of direct hernias. So we'll move on to the left side. Look at the superficial ring first. So we find the rectus abdominis. We have the pubic tubercle inferiorly. And then we move a little bit laterally and we can see nothing but a white line so this is the conjoint tendon here and then immediately lateral to that we take the pressure off and we start looking for veins and the veins will be coming on this angle from deep to superficial and you can see this roof of the inguinal canal here this little white line has a gap in it from the pubic tubercle to here you can see there's no longer a line across there so that, that's how we know that we've arrived at the superficial ring. And so that can be measured. We can perform a strain manoeuvre here. So we ask our patient to strain. You can see clearly there's something moving in front of the pubic tubercle and relax. So from here to here, there's definitely a hernia. And at this stage, you may not know what type of inguinal hernia, but that's totally okay. So the easiest thing to do is to find the veins of your spermatic cord again. So we'll sort of find our rectus abdominis, slide laterally, look for the opening, take the pressure off, hunt around for some veins and there they are there. So at this point we need to come more laterally 
and lay the camera a little flatter so you're coming in from the side so like that a bit of a scoop so we can still aim for the pubic tubercle and we can see now veins that accompany the somatic cord and then follow the veins up so we're pointing the top of the camera towards the ASIS and then follow the veins until you see them dive into the abdomen so there's the little change in angle where they enter the deep ring and of course the v direction of flow will be in the direction of the abdomen so in this case we want to see veins that are flowing in the blue direction if you can see a pulsing artery you'll, you'll be looking at the testicular artery not this one this is inferior epigastric so this can be a good way to look for um, a varicocele to see if there's any reflux as well so we might have to take our wide view off so we steer there's some veins so a little push here just take a big breath in hold your breath for me and then relax again big breath in hold your breath and relax so you can see when the valve salve relaxes or when they breathe normally the veins will flow in the correct direction so gentle push again you get a momentary reflux in the veins sometimes and then relax and you see the blue so that's the pampiniform veins you know that you've arrived at the deep ring when you can identify these structures so I'll point them out so we see the posterior wall of the inguinal canal you follow that white line up and you can see that the veins now diving deep into the abdomen which are just here we can see the inferior epigastric at the back and a little muscular triangle here which is the internal oblique so then once we've identified that deep ring we ask the patient to strain just gently and slowly and then to relax again and we're watching the size of the deep ring whether it opens or not at the moment on relaxed state it's only measuring six mil so a normal deep ring can be up to 10 mil. So I'm moving down to the groin crease and sweeping up from the outside just so the camera's laying a little bit flatter, making that deep ring nice and clear. Okay, so pushing again, slowly, gradually. And then relax. So what you'll all notice is that the deep ring's not actually changing. It's not increasing over 10 mil. But there's plenty of movement just distal to here so there's definitely a hernia but in this case it's not entering via the deep ring so it's probably going to be a direct hernia so to diagnose a direct hernia start with exactly the same landmark so rectus abdominis pubic tubercle move immediately laterally to the region of the conjoint tendon so we can see a gap here this is the superficial ring and now we ask the patient to strain and then relax again so always keep the pubic tubercle in view pushing again and relax now if you're seeing gas shadow like that you know that the hernia contains bowel so I just have to keep repositioning, it's normal. Um, it's never easy to fall on all these structures immediately. But when you can see the pubic tubercle there and you can see veins coming up at you, you know you're in the right place to diagnose the hernia. So in this case, we know the deep ring's normal. We can see there's a hernia in this region. So in trans or long, we could look for what the contents of the hernia are and the size of the neck. Um, so you can see if we're too lateral, the posterior wall and or the peritoneum is going to look intact so if we're very lateral the spermatic cord if we only do a longitudinal assessment it may appear as though there's no hernia so if we strain in this view if I'm very lateral it'll look like the peritoneum's intact and there's no defect if I move medially now 
you can see there's no white line here and we can see bowel swirling around. So as the patient relaxes is the best time to try and find the neck of the hernia as you're compressing it back. So in the last part of the compression, it becomes clear where the actual defect margins are and we can measure it. That's the longitudinal dimension. In transverse, everyone can find a, a pubic symphysis, so it doesn't matter how large the patient is. If you find the symphysis, you move laterally, find the change in bone angle, which is the pubic tubercle, and then we see the start of our inguinal ligament. Immediately superolateral is the spermatic cord. So we know if we move superior to this point, we're on the hot spot, we're on Hasselbach's triangle, which is just here. And so you could ask your patient to strain in this location, so big push. And you can see something coming up vertically at the transducer. And then relax, and we reduce the hernia. We, while you're reducing, you look for the neck. So you can see the neck from here to here, which is where we should be seeing a nice intact uh, peritoneum level with the inguinal ligament. So if we move above, you can see there's a little defect here. Now the type of hernia should be obvious because it's coming straight up at the camera and immediately above the pubic tubercle. So this is a direct hernia. If we keep moving supralaterally, we can identify the um, spermatic cord. So I'll just find the spermatic cord again. So there's superficial ring, there's spermatic cord. Follow those veins until they dive into the abdomen. Here. So we can see clearly the hernia wasn't coming out at this level. It was back down here near the pubic tubercle, so in the mid-canal region. And that's the direct hernia. So if that doesn't work for you, there's one other technique for finding the deep ring, and that is to place the transducer near the umbilicus and run down the rectus abdominis in this transverse plane. The minute you see the, the inferior epigastric artery leave that lateral margin of the rectus abdominis, you'll see it dive and turn horizontally to, to course laterally. That is the deep ring. Categorically, it's always in the same place. So you just plonk, you run down, you see the artery, take a little dive, and then if we turn longitudinal at that point, you can look for the inferior epigastric artery in an axial section. So here's the artery leaving the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis, taking a little dive and we're at the deep ring. So then we start to hunt around for those spermatic cord veins and there they are there. And this is the deep ring which can be measured from, from the top side of the artery to the undersurface of this little triangle of internal oblique. So a little more of a lateral sweep can clean that, that up. So there's your landmarks there. Inferior epigastric artery, we measure from there to the undersurface of the triangle. There's internal oblique. Here's the roof of the canal. So that white line there is just a little thin flat fascia. So when the surgeon cuts down from the skin, the first thing they see is white fascia, which is the continuation of external oblique. And then we can see a little gap, the superficial ring. So rectus abdominis, pubic tubercle. We'll just find our landmarks together. Move a little bit laterally. We find the conjoint tendon. I put a slight oblique on the camera to see that well and then take the pressure off, look for a little gap. We can see a gap open up now, which is the superficial ring. So from here to here, you measure the superficial ring obliquely. Then we rotate the top of the camera to point to the ASIS, and we fall onto the pampiniform veins, which we can follow up to the deep ring. And we see an angulation where they dive into the abdomen and then at this point, we want to take the camera about a centimetre more lateral and then lay it flat. And by coming in from the side, we can clean up that deep ring and see it nice and clearly. 
and we would start our strain here. So we ask the patient to strain and relax again. So in this case we can see a defect here in the posterior wall, but we'll have one more look at that deep ring up here. So one, another push there, big, big strain. There's the deep ring and relax. So nothing coming through that deep ring, nice and tight.